In May 2002, the first Yu-Gi-Oh! TCG limited list was released. This list restricted the use of many powerful cards like Raigeki and Dark Hole, and enabled a variety of decks to be playable. The format that resulted from this list is known as Yugi Kaiba format, and is still actually played today. It's a much better format than the two that preceded it, with a variety of cool and interesting decks that are able to be played, and games that can be really, really interesting and really, really strategic, and reward good skill and knowledge of the format. So let's discuss the major decks and cards of the format, and get into why so many people think this format is so great. What's going on everyone? This is Ben with YGO from Zero, back with another format guide. This time for the first actual playable format in the game, Yugi Kaiba format. Now, unlike the previous two formats I talked about, what makes this a new format isn't any new cards added to the card pool, it's the introduction of a limited list. What the limited list means is that in playing this format, certain cards have their usage restricted. You can still play any card in the game, but you can't necessarily play as many copies as you could before. So let's go through this limited list and discuss a little bit its impact on the format and what's changed from last format. The only monsters that have been limited i.e. you can only play one copy of them, are the pieces of Exodia. So all five pieces have been limited to one copy, and I think this was largely done for flavor reasons. You know, it's supposed to be this all-powerful force that's split into five pieces, and if you gather all five pieces together, you win the game because you've unlocked this incredibly powerful old sorcerer but that flavor is sort of diluted if there are multiple copies of each piece in your deck. It makes it less unique. So these copies have all been limited to one, and I do think this is good gameplay-wise as well. As we saw in LOB format, having multiple copies of Exodia in the game actually does make the deck a lot more consistent and can make it a very frustrating deck to go up against. So limiting it to one really decreases the consistency of the deck, makes the deck a lot worse than it was in previous formats. So I think that's a good thing. Moving on to the most important part of the limited list, we see five very powerful spell cards have been limited to one copy. So players can only play one copy of each of these spell cards in their deck. Pot of Greed, Raigeki, Dark Hole, Change of Heart, and Monster Reborn. These were the five cards that really made the previous formats pretty problematic in my opinion. Just having access to three copies of Raigeki and Dark Hole just gave you access to so many different removal options, made it so that people couldn't really stick monsters on the board long term, which enabled Stall to have just an incredibly powerful game plan because it could get rid of all of its opponent's aggressive beaters while using things like Ultimate Offering to avoid removal. So now with these cards limited to one, it makes the games a bit more interesting because monsters will be more likely to stick around. People have to resort to different options for removal and it's just altogether a lot better. Another great limit, Pot of Greed. This card is just so, so powerful. I mean, there's no reason not to play three copies if you're allowed to. So I think limiting it to one copy is good. I still think it's a problematic card in whatever form it takes, but at least with only one copy, it can only come up once in the game, and you can't just draw into three Pot of Greed potentially and just blow out your opponent by having so many more resources than them. So, Pot of Greed, glad that it got limited as well. Change of Heart is also a great limit. This is just a very powerful tool at taking your opponent's monsters, being able to attack in with them, and also being able to tribute them off with this for something like a Summon Skull. So this is just a very swingy card at three copies. I think at one copy, it's much better. And we'll actually see later on in the video that if it was at three copies, that would make what I think to be the best deck in the format much, much stronger and just be incredibly busted. And lastly, we have Monster Reborn. 
Monster Reborn, I think, is probably the weakest of these five cards, but it's still very powerful. Just being able to bring back a monster from the graveyard, being able to dodge Trap Hole, which is one of the most important trap cards in the format. Incredibly, incredibly strong. So I'm glad that this is limited as well. There were also two spell cards that were semi-limited in the form of Swords of Revealing Light and Card Destruction. I think that both of these are great semi-limits. I don't think these cards are powerful enough to really justify putting them down to one copy, although you can make the argument for Swords, I think, because Swords is just kind of an annoying card to deal with. But at least Swords of Revealing Light has an out in the form of D-Spell, and at two copies, you know, it can slow down the game a bit, but it's not as bad as it was at three. And for card destruction, I think that limiting it to two really does hamper the ability of the stall mill deck to just kill you out of nowhere. It's a lot easier to kill out of nowhere with three copies of card destruction to really blow at your opponent as opposed to two copies of card destruction. So I think that's good. I don't think this is really powerful enough to merit being reduced down to one copy. And we'll actually see in some of the example deck lists later on that some stall mill decks have opted to cut this down to one copy anyways. So two copies, I don't think is problematic at all. And it's much better than having three copies in the format. So overall, I think that this limited list is incredibly good, really stopping a lot of the problematic elements of the previous formats and making the game actually somewhat playable. But now that we've gotten the talk of the limited list out of the way, let's actually talk about the format itself. Okay, now that we've talked about the limited list, let's talk about the format itself. Now, when building decks for this format, there are basically two different directions you can go. You can either go aggro or you can go stall. So these two different directions differ a lot in terms of what they're trying to accomplish but they often share a lot of the same cards. So let's just discuss the cards that you're likely to see in a lot of the decks in this format. First up, we have the level four beaters in the form of La Jin, Neo, and Battle Ox. These are the level four monsters in the format with the highest amount of attack, and you'll find them pretty much in every aggro deck at three copies. There are some aggro decks that go for a more tribal strategy that will potentially play other monsters instead, but in general, these are going to be the ones that you'll encounter. The other major offensive threat that you're likely to encounter is Summon Skull. Summon Skull is a one tribute monster with 2500 attack, which means it can get over pretty much everything else in the game at this point. And it also combos extremely well with Change of Heart, being able to turn Change of Heart into more of a removal spell instead of just a temporary aggressive push. Now, there are some decks that I'll get into later that actually their main goal is to utilize Summon Skull in combination with Change of Heart and another spell I'll talk about later called Soul Exchange to basically control the board and make these big offensive plays. But I'll get into that later when I talk about decks more specifically. Even if an aggro deck is not that sort of deck, which is called Soul Control, it is likely to be playing at least one Summon Skull just so it can get the most out of change of heart. And also just to have a big beater to potentially get in for a lot of damage near the end of the game. It's, it's just a very good card to be aware of. Moving on to the more defensive side of things, we have Giant Soldier of Stone and the other 2k defenders in the format, Aquamador, Mystical Elf, and Spirit of the Harp. Now, most decks you'll likely to see just three copies of Giant Soldier of Stone because it's an incredibly powerful defensive tool and it's 1300 attack can actually be useful to press the offensive when you're in a pinch. However, a lot of stall decks will be likely to play the additional 2k defenders as well. And even some sort of aggro decks will also choose to play more than just three defenders in their deck, maybe play a bit more to protect their life points while they set up for big plays or to get the most out of something like ultimate offering. So these defenders are good to know about, but most decks that you'll encounter will probably just be on three soldiers of stone. 
There is one sort of defender in the game that's not a 2K defender that sees play called Wall of Illusion. Wall of Illusion is interesting because it only has 1850 defense, which is less than all of the 2K defenders, but it has a powerful effect that lets you return any monster that attacks into it back to the hand at the end of damage calculation. This can be powerful in the right situations, like potentially bouncing back something like a Summon Skull to hand can be very good, but it can also be pretty bad in other situations. If your opponent uses a flip effect monster like Man Eater Bug or Trap Master and then attacks into Wall of Illusion, then they'll be able to get that monster back into their hand so they can use it once again. So Wall of Illusion is a card that doesn't necessarily see as much play as the regular 2k defenders, but it can be a useful side deck option for when you're going up against a deck that has a bunch of tribute monsters in it. And there are some decks that want to bounce your opponent's monsters back to hand because they value the tempo more than giving your opponent back a resource. So Wall of Illusion is a bit of an iffy card, but it can be powerful in the right situations. Moving on to our other effect monsters that see play, we have Man Your Bug, which is basically a removal spell. It's incredibly good. When it's flipped face up, you target one monster on the field and destroy it. So that can be incredibly, incredibly powerful to get rid of your opponent's big offensive threats. It can be a bit risky at the same time. If your opponent does change of heart it away, then they'll be able to use it on your monsters. But... In general, it's better to have it in the deck than not. And also, if you play smartly with it, then you can prevent your opponent from doing plays like that and utilize Meteor Bug to its fullest effect. So, Meteor Bug, an incredibly good card. Pretty much every deck plays it at three copies. And lastly, for the more generic monsters, we've got Trap Master. Now, I mentioned Trap Master in the last format as well and said that it wasn't quite as good as Remove Trap in that format because the main target for Trap Master in last format was definitely Ultimate Offering, which just was so powerful when there was so, so many removal tools. So you'd mainly be using it on Ultimate Offering, but because there were so many removal spells like Raigeki and Dark Hole at three copies, Trap Master likely wasn't going to actually resolve its effect, and so something like Remove Trap was actually a little bit better. This format, however, Trap Master is the better trap removal option, in my opinion. Although, I will say that it's probably not good enough to include in the main deck. You probably want to put this in the side deck for decks that specifically use Ultimate Offering to its fullest potential, as the card can honestly not really do much in other matchups and also can be a bit of a liability to yourself if your opponent does change of heart it and manage to use it on one of your traps. So Trap Master is a bit of an iffy card, kind of like Wall of Illusion, more of a side deck option than a main deck option to be sure. And that covers pretty much all the monsters that you're most likely to see in the game. There are some other decks in this format that either incorporate a tribal strategy and use monsters like Great White combined with something like Umi to get more powerful offensive tools. And there are also some decks that utilize other tribute monsters like Judge Man in addition to Summon Skull just to maximize the amount they can use their opponent's monsters to tribute with. But in general, these are the ones that are likely to pop up in most matchups that you'll face. I will discuss the other decks later in this video though. So if you're looking forward to those, stick around. Hopefully you won't be disappointed. But before I can get into those other decks, let's discuss the spell cards. So as I mentioned in the limited list discussion, Pot of Greed, Raigeki, Dark Hole, Change of Heart, Monster Reborn, all super powerful. Even though they're limited, every deck still wants to play them. So pretty much every deck in the format is going to play all five of these. They're just incredibly, incredibly good. I explained what made them so good on the limited list section of the video, so I'm not going to really dive into that now. Just like these limited cards, you might expect that all the semi-limited spells will also see play in pretty much every deck. And that is true of Swords of Revealing Light, as Swords of Revealing Light is an incredibly powerful card that most decks will play the full two copies of, 
but it's not quite true of card destruction. As card destruction is a bit more niche, slots into the stall mill strategies a bit more, or in the side deck against Exodia strategies. So you're less likely to see card destruction than you are swords, but swords is incredibly powerful and most decks will be playing it in the main deck. Since a lot of decks are playing it in the main deck, a lot of decks are also playing Dispel in the main deck. Dispel is one of the only ways to get rid of a Swords of Dealing Light, and it's incredibly, incredibly good. It can really mess up your opponent's plans if they're relying on a Swords of Dealing Light to get them out of a tricky spot and you Dispel them. It can honestly potentially win the game for you. Dispel can also serve some additional utility in potentially sniping your opponent's set spell cards. Oftentimes in this format, you want to set spell cards as a bluff for your opponent. And if you're able to figure out that your opponent's trying to bluff you, then you can use Dispel as a way to remove a potentially powerful spell card that your opponent thought was safe. So Dispel, pretty good side deck inclusion, and potentially even a main deck inclusion. I know a lot of decks do main deck Dispel just because it's so good against swords. Another card that you're likely to see in a lot of decks, although certainly not every deck, is Soul Exchange. Soul Exchange is the backbone of one of the most powerful decks in the format, Soul Control. And even in decks that aren't playing Soul Control, many will play Soul Exchange just because it's a very good way to get powerful monsters on the field, like Summon Skull. And it's also a good way to remove your opponent's potential threats. So Soul Exchange is a pretty good card and you should be aware of it when playing the format. Basically what it lets you do is it lets you tribute one of your opponent's monsters for one of your own cards. So you can tribute an opponent's monster to summon out a summon skull. But you can't conduct your battle phase the turn you use it. So it can be a bit annoying as, you know, you've just brought out a big monster that can that you'd want to attack with, but it restricts you from attacking for that one turn. But generally the removal is good enough. And oftentimes your monster will stick around to the next turn because there is a lot less removal in this format than the last format. So Soul Exchange, very, very good. Speaking of removal in this format though, we lastly have Fisher. And this is a case of last but certainly not least because Fisher is an incredibly, incredibly powerful removal spell in this format. It's still at three copies and most decks do play it at three copies just because it can remove monsters very easily, and oftentimes your opponent won't have that many monsters on their side of the field. So generally you don't need to worry about the lowest attack restriction on this card. And even if they do have multiple monsters on the field, you can often get around the lowest attack restriction by potentially attacking their lowest attack monster, getting rid of it, and then using Fissure on the remaining monster that you want to get rid of. So. Fisher is a very, very good card, and pretty much every deck plays at three. And lastly, we have the traps. So the three big important traps in the format are Reinforcements, Trap Hole, and Waboku, all of which are incredibly strong, and pretty much all of which see play in pretty much every deck. Reinforcements is probably the one that not every deck plays, because a lot of stall decks don't really care about increasing the attack of their monsters but Reinforcements is played in pretty much every aggro deck as it lets you increase the attack of your monsters, potentially let them get over other monsters that they otherwise wouldn't have. Reinforcements can also serve as a way to end a game prematurely. If you're attacking in with a monster and your monster is 500 off from being able to kill your opponent, you can flip Reinforcements in the damage step and just kill your opponent out of nowhere. It's also important to note that reinforcements can activate in the damage step at a time when Woboku cannot activate in response to it. Woboku is pretty much the major defensive trap in this format. It prevents you from taking battle damage the turn you activate it, and it also prevents your monsters from being destroyed by battle the turn that you activate it. So, since it doesn't directly modify attack or defense, it can't be activated in the damage step, and thus reinforcements can be used to get around Waboku's damage prevention if it's used right. So that's an important thing to note, and it's an interaction that comes up fairly often. 
Lastly, we have Trap Hole, and Trap Hole is also an incredibly important trap card in this format. It's removal on your opponent's turn, so it can be used very defensively, and it's just good at clearing away your opponent's monsters, you know, depriving them of resources. So very, very good card, one that you always have to watch out for, and one that there are very few ways to get around. Speaking of ways to get around Trap Hole, the last trap that I want to talk about is Ultimate Offering. Now, Ultimate Offering is nowhere near as prevalent in this format as it was in the last format because there's much less removal and oftentimes it can be a bit of a brick, especially if you play more than one copy. And so it's just not as good this format as it was last format. However, it still is a pretty good card in decks that can accommodate it. Ultimate Offering is a way to get around Trap Hole in a lot of instances. You can chain its effect to the activation of something like a Fissure and be able to summon out a monster on Chain Link 2, which then your opponent will not be able to activate Trap Hole in response to. So that can be incredibly, incredibly useful. You can also chain it to itself to bring out one monster if you only have one monster in your hand and prevent that monster from being able to be trap hold as the monster will have been summoned chain link 2 and at chain link 1 ultimate offering will resolve without effect because you have no monsters left in hand so there's a lot of very clever things that you can do with this card to get around trap hole and that makes it pretty useful it can also be very useful at defending yourself, just like it was in the last format. A lot of stall decks do play this card at 3, just because it's very useful for getting out big defenders on the field during your opponent's battle phase, allowing them to dodge your opponent's removal. And so it's just a very, very good card in certain circumstances. But it is one of those cards that is not going to be in every single deck. Before I dive in to some of the more specific strategies in this format, I want to mention one last card that is slightly generic, which is Stop Defense. Stop Defense is a very interesting card that honestly doesn't receive much play despite being pretty powerful. Uh, it basically lets you switch one of your opponent's monsters to face up attack position, which can be very good at getting over your opponent's defenders and things like that. But many aggro decks don't opt to play it, in the main deck at least, because it can just be dead. It doesn't help you on a board where your opponent has aggressive threats that you need to get rid of, unlike Fissure, which can be used to stop both aggressive threats and defensive threats. So it's generally not played. However, I do think that you can definitely play it if you want to, if you want to get very aggressive with your deck. And also it could be a good side deck option just to prevent your opponent's stall decks from being as powerful as they otherwise could be. But anyways, those are some of the most important cards in the format. And I did allude to some decks in the format. So let's actually dive in to all the different sorts of decks that can be played in this format because there are quite a lot and that is a very good thing in my opinion. So... As I said previously, Yugi Kaiba format has a variety of decks in it, a variety of very cool decks in it, and I just want to briefly discuss them in this section of the video here. I will be showing off some deck lists for some of these decks later in the video, but I figure I'd discuss them all at once now just to give context for the general layout of the format. So. By far and away, the most popular deck in the format is Soul Control. And Soul Control, as I mentioned previously, is basically you use Soul Exchange and Change of Heart in conjunction with Tribute Monsters to get rid of your opponent's monsters, bring out offensive monsters of your own, and just generally control the board, deprive your opponent of resources, etc. This, I think, is probably the best deck in the format. I, I would go out on a limb and say that. I think it's very good. There are some decks that have a good matchup against it, but Soul Control, I think, is very flexible, very versatile, and can just 
be very, very difficult to deal with. The deck does have its issues. If it draws into either too many soul exchanges without tribute monsters or too many tribute monsters without soul exchanges, then it can be in for a rough time just having dead cards in hand. But in general, I do think it is the best deck of the format. And it, there are also other decks that I'm going to talk about that brick a lot worse than this. Discussing the other sort of aggro decks in the format first, we next have Tribal Strategies. Now, there, there are a couple different ways you can go with Tribal Strategies, but I'm going to classify them in two broad categories. We have Field Tribal and Equip Tribal. Field Tribal aims to use a field spell card like Umi, Forest, Wasteland, any of those, to buff their monsters, enable their monsters to potentially get over their opponent's monsters that are unbuffed by the field spell. I think the best of these is Umi Tribal, where you play Umi and you play Great Whites, which have 1600 attack, that then get buffed up to 1800 attack under Umi to essentially give yourself more copies of La Jin, which can be very good. But I do know that some other field spell tribal decks are popular as well. And each one has their own advantages and disadvantages. These decks do also have their own flaws though. If you don't draw Umi, or if you draw too many Umis, then the deck can really falter. And also if your opponent plays Great Whites as well, then they can benefit from this buff as well. But generally I view Umi aggro as sort of like a similar level as Sogan aggro in LOB format, where it can win games more than other sort of jank decks. And it actually has a good matchup against some decks. And it's pretty fun to play. I also think that Field Spell Tribal is a bit better than Equip Spell Tribal. Now, Equip Spell Tribal, basically, you're trying to use Equip Spells to give your monsters buff to get over your opponent's monsters. A popular Equip Spell Tribal strategy is Fiend Beating, where you basically use Fiends and Dark Monsters combined with Equip Spell cards like Sword of Dark Destruction or Dark Energy to buff your monsters over your opponents. However, unlike Field Spell Tribal decks like Umi, each Equip Spell card can only affect one monster. So, basically, at best, that monster is probably going to be able to remove one of your opponent's monsters that it would un otherwise be unable to trade for. But then your monster is probably going to die to removal, like a Fisher or anything else. So, it's not quite as good as Umi or other field spells that just can keep giving you some benefits as once that monster dies, you lose the equip spell card as well. But it is an interesting deck to consider and other equip spell decks like this are, they're, they're all fun to play to some extent. So I don't think that this deck is good necessarily, but it can be fun to play and fun to consider. Speaking of decks that are also not good and fun to play, we have fusion decks. So the, these decks basically try and fusion summon powerful monsters like Guy the Dragon Champion or Metal Dragon, the next most powerful fusion monster in the game, and use those monsters to beat their opponent's faces in. Now, this is not the best strategy because you have to basically assemble three cards to actually use the fusion strategy no matter what fusion strategy you're playing, polymerization and the two fusion materials that you want to use. And again, since there is removal in this format, if your opponent removes your fusion monster, then you've lost a lot of resources sinking into that. And you're in a pretty bad spot. But these, these sorts of decks are fun for people who just want to have anime moments and, you know be okay with bricking for the majority of games just to pull off the god combo in one game and probably not win that one game. So fusion decks are interesting and I will cover them on the channel in the future. I'm planning on covering all these decks that I talk about in the future on the channel just in their own games, but they're generally not that good. For a slightly better jank option, we have dragons. Now, 
Dragons basically revolve around Lord of D, Flute of Summoning Dragon, and an incredibly powerful dragon monster like Blue Eyes White Dragon or Trihorn Dragon or things like that. Basically, if you summon out Lord of D and activate Flute of Summoning Dragon, you get to special summon dragon monsters from your hand for free. And Lord of D prevents them from being targeted with card effects. Now, this may seem pretty good, but in actuality, it's very, very fragile. You know, the boards that dragons make die to a Raigeki or a Dark Hole, and oftentimes the hands can brick. You don't really want to see Flu Summoning Dragon without Lord of D, or the big dragon monsters like Blue Eyes or Trihorned without any way to get them onto the field. And so that can be a bit rough. But when you do pull off the combo, just like for Fusion, it feels incredible, and even though you may lose the game, it's still fun to do. Moving on, we have the Wicked Worm Beast decks. So, this is a deck that's not really played that much, but I figured I'd mention it here because Worm Control was pretty much the dominant aggro deck of the last format just being able to leverage all the removal spells in the format very well and dodge the opponent's removal spells very well. So it was definitely the best aggro deck last format. This format, however, since a lot of the removal spells have been hit, it's a lot less good. You still can play a worm control deck like this, but it's not quite as powerful as it once was, or even as powerful as some of the other big threats in the format. However, it does have a pretty decent matchup against Soul Control, as if you get into a board state where your opponent just has no monsters, maybe has a Soul Exchange and a Tribute Monster in hand, you just keep bringing out Wicked Worm Beast and attacking in, then they won't be able to do anything about that, and you may be able to just win the game off the back of that. So, while not the best deck in the game, I do think it is better than a lot of other decks, a lot of other jank decks, so I wanted to mention it here. Now, one thing about that Worm Control deck is that it makes heavy use of Ultimate Offering, just like a lot of other decks in the format. Ultimate Offering is a very flexible card, and it can be the basis for either aggro or stall decks. On the aggro side of things, you can play a bunch of beaters and ultimate offering and attempt to just overwhelm your opponent with your beaters. You can also dodge trap hole with ultimate offering, as I mentioned earlier. And so there are decks just basically based around this card, although maybe they won't play three copies, they might play two or one, just to give themselves a bit of an aggressive edge. And there are also decks that can use ultimate offering in conjunction with defenders, to defend their life points and then bring out more offensive monsters to attack in while they've defended themselves. And that can be a, a very powerful strategy as well. Now, I'm not sure how many people play the next deck, but it apparently did well in a tournament once. And that's basically Last Will Turbo, kind of. Uh, it's very interesting. Last Will is a very interesting card. It can be used in decks to bring out defenders after you've lost a monster trap hole, or it can be used in something like a dragon deck to bring out Lord of D. So Lost Will is very interesting, and there actually was a deck that sought to leverage its power to basically, whenever their monster would die, it would just play Lost Will, bring out a defender from deck to recoup that loss a little bit. And this was good enough to do very well in a tournament. So I think that's a really cool deck idea, and I wanted to highlight it here. The last of these sorts of aggressive decks that I want to talk about is sort of back row control or trap master control. Basically, the idea of this deck is that you use trap master, or if you want to go really crazy, trap master and arm ninja to basically keep sniping your opponent's back rows getting rid of their powerful trap cards and giving you advantage. I think that just the straight up Trap Master version is okay. Trap Master is a decent card that not many people are necessarily expecting, and you can snipe away your opponent's resources, which is pretty nice. The only issue is, is that you have to play Trap Masters, and I don't think Trap Masters 
are that good otherwise, especially if your opponent is playing soul control or if they use a change of heart on trap master that can really mess up your own back row. So I don't think the deck is quite that good. It is interesting though, and I thought I'd bring it up. And as a note, the version with our ninjas as well, I think it's just terrible. I think it's abjectly terrible. Um, because, you know, while your opponent can set spell cards to play around the trap masters, you're not necessarily likely to snipe them with Arm Ninja, and the Arm Ninjas are just going to be largely useless in the deck. Moving on to more of these stall strategies, we have Stall Mill. Stall Mill is probably the best stall strategy in the format, in my opinion, and it can be really tough to deal with. It's not the tier zero mega threat it was last format, but I think it's definitely very good and can give a lot of decks a run for their money. And it's something to be aware of. And if you're a degenerate, it's something that you can maybe play. So stall mill, pretty good deck in the format. Moving on to other stall decks, we've got Exodia, the classic. Even though each piece of Exodia was limited down to one copy, you can still potentially win game one with Exodia just stalling for enough time to assemble all five pieces in your hand. You can get a bit unlucky if all the pieces are at the bottom of your deck or if you open just a bunch of pieces in hand and thus start with less usable resources than your opponent. But generally you can win game one and then potentially smoke screen into something else. Card destruction is in the format, so you don't want to keep this around for games two and three because your opponent can just side in card destructions. While Stall Mill I think is the better deck, Stall Exodia is still very funny and also can be very satisfying if you want to pull off Exodia and actually manage to do so. Moving on from the somewhat playable stall strategies, we also have Stall Burn. Now, stall burn here is a bit of a misnomer. You're not quite using every burn card in the game to win through exclusively burn. What you're doing is you're supplementing damage from attacks, damage from your opponents attacking into defenders, things like that, to get your opponent low enough to potentially blow them out with something like just desserts or some ukazis. Do I think that this is a particularly good deck? Eh, not really, but I will be honest, I haven't done much experimenting with it. This is just mainly from a theory perspective. It just doesn't seem as good as other stall strategies, but it is one that you can play if you want to. And that covers pretty much all the decks that I think are interesting enough and unique enough to be mentioned while also having a chance of actually winning. You know, for instance, there has been rumblings of making a deck using Reverse Trap and a field spell like Yami, with the idea being that you activate Yami and you use Reverse Trap to, you know, debuff your opponent's Lodge-ins or Neos or things like that. I honestly don't think that deck can, can feasibly win, or at least consistently win. And it's just it just seems really bad to me. So I'm not really, I don't really want to include it with all these other decks that I think have a much better chance of winning. But there are sort of interesting ideas like that out there in the format. There are cards that people don't really play that you can choose to play and build a deck around. It's just these are the main decks you'll see in the format and the main decks that actually do something that might actually win the game. But anyways, now that I've discuss the decks just in theory and briefly talking about what they do. Let's just show off some example deck lists before I dive into my final thoughts on the format. Okay, let's dive in to some example decks here now that I've discussed about the different decks in the format in brief. Now for these deck lists, I'm largely going to show deck lists that are featured on the Yugi Kaiba Land Discord, a link to which I will have in the description of this video. And so these are made by players that have played the format a lot more than me, or a lot more experienced than me, and thus can probably deck build better than I ever could. 
This soul control list was made by Jazz, who is a very good duelist in this format, and I'm pretty sure had actually won a tournament with this deck. So I'm providing this as an example. So this deck is generally seen as the standard for soul control deck lists that everyone who's just starting out trying the deck should use. So as I mentioned before, Soul Control is a deck that aims to use tribute monsters like Summon Skull in conjunction with spell cards like Change of Heart and Soul Exchange to deprive your opponent of monsters while bringing out powerful monsters of your own. The deck is pretty straightforward. It has three copies of each of the major four-star beaters, Lajin, Neo, and Battleox to keep up offensive pressure. It has Giant Soldiers of Stone to protect itself from your opponent's attacks and potentially attack in with its 1300. It also has Man Eater Bugs to act as a pseudo removal spell to deprive your opponent of monsters as well. It also has all the powerful spell cards that have been limited, Change of Heart, Dark Hole, Raigeki, Pot of Greed, and Monster Reborn. Three Fisher to serve as great removal. Two Soul Exchange to match up with the Three Summon Skull. With one change of heart and two soul exchange, that provides exactly three ways to get these summon skull onto the field without using your own monsters. So that's why that ratio is the way that it is. Two swords of the light as well, because that's also an incredibly good card, can buy you some time and be difficult for your opponent to deal with. And also one D spell to get rid of our opponent's spell cards that they may have set as bluffs but also to get rid of their Swords Revealing Light. So D-Spell is pretty good for keeping up the offensive pressure. And then for the traps, three reinforcement, three trap holes, three Wubokus, just the standard good traps. Reinforcements is especially good since this deck has so many offensive beaters, so it can combo very well with those. Moving on to the side deck, we have Two Wall of Illusion. These are great to bring in against other Soul Control decks. We also have an Aquamador in case we want to get a bit more defensive. Three Trap Masters. These are great to bring in against decks using Ultimate Offering or just to bring in to surprise your opponent to snipe a trap. Two Judge Man and one Soul Exchange. These are especially great against Stall because it lets us sort of deal more with their 2k defenders. Two card destructions, these are great against Exodia decks. You know, they're trying to assemble all five pieces. If you manage to discard some of the pieces, they just lose. One more D spell, again, great against stall decks that are playing swords, but also good against players who set a lot of spell cards as bluffs. Two just desserts to punish players who are playing a lot of monsters on their field and one ultimate offering in case we want to pivot into a more aggressive direction. This is just a classic soul control list. It's very, very good, very, very fine tuned. It's a great deck for anyone who wants to start off exploring the format. Very powerful, can teach you a lot of the fundamental lessons that you need to be successful in the, in the format. And so it's honestly what I'd recommend players start out with, even though even if they might think that another deck would suit them better. This is just a great one to start. But now that I've shown the sort of standard deck on the aggressive side of things, I guess I should also show the standard stall deck in the format. So here we have DK Zero's stall mill deck that is heralded as another sort of example deck list in the Yugi Kaiba Land Discord. And I'm pretty sure that DK0 also used it to win a tournament at some point as well. And this is a very, very good deck. And just like Soul Control, Stall Mill is sort of the best stall deck in the format. So this is a great deck for people to start out with who want to play stall and are new to the format. I don't know why you would, but it's here. So let's just jump into the deck breakdown. We, of course, have all the 2k defenders in the game in here just to protect our life points as much as possible. We can bring these out with one of the three ultimate offerings we have in our deck. 
during our opponent's battle phase, and it can be really tough for them to deal with these, especially if we're just able to keep up a steady stream going with our ultimate offerings. We also have three Wall of Illusion. Wall of Illusion is also a card that serves as a pseudo defender for us, but it can also be good against soul control if they bring out something like a summoned skull, we can bounce it back to hand. So wall of illusion, pretty good. And of course we have three man eater bug to clear away our opponent's monsters. Another very good card. All these defenders are great. They can all be brought out off of ultimate offerings effect during your opponent's turn to potentially dodge some removal. And it's just very, very tough for your opponent to deal with. We also have another monster in this deck that's very good and can be very, very powerful at depriving your opponent of more resources, and that is Gyaku Tenno Megami. Gyaku Tenno Megami is a level 6 monster with 2,000 defense, so it is a tribute monster, but the deck is also playing one change of heart to soul exchange to be able to use your opponent's monsters to bring it out. Since this deck doesn't really care about the battle phase, soul exchange's restriction really doesn't affect it at all, which is very nice. And this can be great at getting rid of your opponent's tribute monsters that they might have brought out to combat your deck. And it's just a very very cool inclusion into the deck. It can break a little, but generally you'll have stalled your opponent so that you don't necessarily need to use every card in your hand right away, and you can generally draw into the combo over the course of the game. Moving on to the spells, we of course have Dark Hole, Fishers, Monster Reborn, Pot of Greed, Raigeki, Change of Heart. These are the power cards of the game. Change of Heart can combo with Gyakuteno and Megami as I mentioned before. These are just all very, very good cards for the strategy. We also have three Fishers to deal with our opponent's monsters. And we have the two aforementioned Soul Exchanges and two Swords of the Light, a very powerful stall tool. We also have one card destruction. Now, there actually is some debate on the proper number of card destructions to use and what's most optimal. You know, two card destruction may be a bit bricky as you don't want to really draw card destruction early in the game. Zero card destruction could prevent you from being able to close out the game, or if you're in a bad spot, prevent you from recovering by getting rid of useless cards from your hand. So it is a bit of a debate going on. I really like the use of one card destruction here. You know, you can get rid of your opponent's resources that they might have been holding on to while also getting the game one step closer to the end. You can, you know, as a last ditch effort, try and draw into your vital stalling pieces to protect yourself for as long as possible. I like the inclusion of one card destruction here. I think it's very good. Moving on to the traps, we have three trap hole to add removal on our opponent's turn. Three ultimate offering. We don't really care if we brick on this or if we draw too many of it because it's such a necessary piece of our deck and we're a stall deck anyways, so it doesn't really matter that much. And of course, three Woboku, the ultimate defensive trap in the game. You'll notice that we have 43 cards in deck. I think this is a very good number for a stall mill deck to have. This means that even if you activate Pot of Greed, you'll still be one card ahead of your opponent. And so I think that's very good. And then for the side deck, we have a bit of a smokescreen side here to side into a more standard soul control build that is maybe also playing some defenders. So I think this is a very good side deck here as well. Um... If I was adjusting it, maybe I'd put in a Battle Ox instead of a Soul Exchange, but I do like the inclusion of a Soul Exchange just to provide a little bit more removal. Maybe you keep a Yaku Tenu Megami in the deck just to give you that extra oomph of removal and make the Soul Control combo less likely to not come together. Because with 43 cards in your deck, it might be a bit less consistent than it otherwise would be. But this deck is a very good deck for anyone who wants to start out in the format and play stall, just be a war criminal. And thank goodness that this deck is definitely not tier 0. It definitely can be beaten. It has a bit of a rough matchup against soul control oftentimes. And there are many ways to side against it. 
Now that I've shown off the two standard deck lists in the format, one for aggro, one for stall, I want to show off one more deck list before diving into my final thoughts. Okay, so this deck is not one of the best decks in the format. It's honestly pretty jank, but I wanted to show it off because this is the first like original deck that I made in the format. The concept's been explored before, but in all the card choices and stuff, I was largely just judging based off my own experiences, dueling the format a bit, and I, I'm really happy with this deck, and I think it's very fun. So I present to you Worm Control. Now, as I mentioned, this concept has been explored before in the format. It's been called Worm Burn. It's had a couple different names. But basically the idea here is you're attempting to clear away your opponent's board and use the Wicked Worm Beast to get in for damage. I am definitely going to show off this deck on the channel a bit more in some duels, but I think this deck sort of shows that despite having a core that is pretty much the same as any other deck in the format, it's got the three Lodge In, three Battle Ox, three Neo, three Man Your Bug, a Summon Skull, a Change of Heart, all the other power spells, three Fishers, two Swords, all the power traps, and then two Ultimate Offering as well. I think that this sort of shows that there's still a lot of creativity that can come out in the additional slots, in the parts of the deck that are a bit more flexible. And it can lead to some very different play styles. And I think, you know, on a more personal level, this deck sort of showed a lot of my satisfaction with the format. Like, after playing the format for only two weeks or so, I was able to build a deck of my own that I think captured a lot of my personality, captured a lot of the playstyle that I really like, and just bring it into games and play games. It doesn't win all the games that it plays, but it can win a couple, and that's good enough for me. And every game that I do play with the deck is still fun. You know, I, I have a blast, even if I'm playing decks that are a lot stronger than me. So I think that this format is great, even if you play jank, even if you play decks that are objectively worse than the best decks in the format, I think that the format still has a lot to offer you and can offer you some amazing duels. So I'm not going to go as in depth with this deck as I did the other two decks. I'll save that for a future video when I'm showing it off. But I just wanted to display it here to basically say that despite having a large core of cards that are generally included in pretty much every deck. There's still a lot of room for creativity, a lot of room for self-expression, and you can have fun with a variety of decks and a variety of cards. So now that I've gotten that out of the way, let's get into my final thoughts on the format. So I've said it before and I'll say it again. In the beginning, the Yu-Gi-Oh card game was not meant to actually be a playable game. It was meant to sort of let people relive the fun moments from the anime, play around with like Dark Magician, Blue Eyes White Dragon, all those iconic cards, and just sort of be not that competitive, be a very casual sort of thing. This format is built out of this first sort of consideration that Konami gave to an actual competitive version of this game in America. You know, as I've documented over the course of this channel, the previous two formats to this were not really fun to play. You know, having Raigeki and Dark Hole just run rampant as removal made stall decks dominant. And while LOB format doesn't really have what I'd call a tier zero deck, although Exodia is the best deck in the format, SDYK format definitely did in the form of Stall Mill, which was just super oppressive to play against, super unfun, and just a rough format all around. Limiting Raigeki, Dark Hole, and all the other powerful spells in the game really does help make this format playable, and it lets really cool decks rise to the surface like Soul Control. And as a note, Soul Control still lets players play with an incredibly iconic card from the anime, Summon Skull. 
So I do think that this format is still great for anyone who wants to play and relive the iconic anime moments. It's just they might not be able to do it with Dark Magician and Blue Eyes White Dragon. I also think this format is great for anyone who wants to really think a lot when dueling. You know, I've heard this format likened a lot to chess, and I do think that the comparison is somewhat valid. You know, there's a lot of thinking, a lot of managing of resources that you have to do with every move that you make. And if you make one wrong move, that can just lose you the game over the course of the rest of it. You know, mistakes can propagate. And it makes you have to be very careful in everything that you do in this format. And it makes the games really, really fun, despite how thought intensive they are. As I've said, I think that this format is the first quote unquote playable format in the game because it's just really, really fun. Even if you go up against a degenerate deck, the games I still find to be enjoyable. And I think that, you know, that's shown in the amount of people that actually played this format. There is a pretty big community of people who do play Yugi Kaiba format. I'll have links in the description below to both Yugi Kaiba Land and the Format Library Discord, where people talk about this format, where they play this format, and where you can go to play this format for yourself. I think it's a really cool community, and I've really enjoyed getting to duel people in it over the past couple weeks. So I hope that if this video has piqued your interest in the format, you check it out as well and just jump into some duels and play some games. You might be surprised with how fun it is. I'm going to be featuring some of my own duels on the channel in the coming weeks. So look forward to those. But until next time, this has been my guide to Yugi Kaiba format. I hope you found it helpful. Again, as always, if you have any feedback for the video, please be sure to put that in the comments down below. And I hope that you found this video helpful if you're trying to get into the format. Until next time, I've been Ben with YGO from Zero, and I'm signing off.